So what I'm going to be talking about is um, diffraction. So we're in chapter 36 of the textbook for Halliday, Resnick, and Walker. Um, and uh, we've already talked about diffraction, um, or at least the double slit um, diffraction experiment, um, the Young's experiment, um, previously. Um, but now we're going to kind of focus on other, other applications of um, diffraction. So now we've already done the double slit, but now we're going to move on and do the single slit. So um, uh, in section 36.1, we're going to talk about single slit experiment. <clears throat> uh, so the, the setup is very similar to the double slit experiment, except for we have one opening. Um, there's a screen back here in which to project the diffraction um, image on. Uh, the slit has a width of A. So A is the slit width. The distance between the slit and the screen, uh, I'm going to call L again. And, um, and I'm just going to draw the center line right here. Basically the midpoint of the slit to the screen. So what we have is we have a um, a wave, a light wave. In this case, it's a plane wave, which is now incident on the um, slit. And then what happens is it diffracts and then produces a spherical wave, which will then eventually project an image on the screen where we have a bright spot a dark spot, a bright spot, a dark spot, um, just like with the double slit um, experiment that we have. But there's a slightly di there's a, a different feature to it. So let me draw this again, and then we can figure out um, exactly um, how we can predict what the image is going to look like on the screen. So here is my slit. And here is the screen. <clears throat> um, and so the question is, how can we get diffraction out of this experiment if I only have one opening to, um, only have one slit? With the double slit experiment, we said that um, the, the two slits were basically acting as two sources. And then those would produce circular waves, which would then interfere with each other. So it's the interference of the light going through each of the slits, which will create a pattern of constructive and destructive interference. So now the question is, if I have a plane wave coming impinging on here, then how can I, you know, I only have one source. How can that one source interfere with itself? So the trick is, is that we um, have, uh, we can basically employ Huygens principle. So the light that is going through this um, slit right here will, we can think of as now a series of um, point sources on the wave front, and each of those point sources creates wavelets, and so those wavelets can in fact interfere with each other. <clears throat> um, so whether that's just a nice mathematical description or whether that actually happens in nature, um, but it seems to fit because light going through a single opening will diffract and it will then create an interference pattern on the other side. So, you know, you, what you could think of it now is, you know, um, the light that is basically diffracting around the edges um, is going to be moving in a different direction than the light going straight to the middle. And so you, you, you will have kind of a, um, uh, an interference pattern out of it. <clears throat> okay, so then how do we derive the the diffraction pattern? Well, what I'm going to do is break it up as if it is two sources. And so the width of this one source is A divided by 2. And the width of this other source is A divided by 2. And so now what I have is light ray from this source going over and meeting in, on that side. And then light from this source over here is going to 
um, meet at the same point. And so we can say maybe at this angle theta. <clears throat> and so those two rays of light coming from the two different parts of the opening, if they are a multiple of a wavelength um, out of phase with each other, then they're going to um, uh, constructively interfere and make a bright spot. If they're a half a wavelength out of phase, then they're going to inter inter uh, interfere with each other destructively, and you'll get a dark band um, right there. Okay, so, so if we now just look at this as a double slit experiment, where we've broken the single opening up into two pieces, then what we would have is the exact same derivation for double slit um, diffraction, um, where now you have the, the space between the slits is A over two, <coughs> sine theta, and that's equal to a multiple of um, the wavelengths so if it's destructive interference, they're going to be half a wavelength out of phase. And so it would be half a wavelength or three halves or five halves, um, et cetera. So instead, we can write this as A over 2 sine theta is equal to some multiple over 2 of the wavelength, where now M, in this case, runs from one, two, three. Um, so I said this is for destructive. This is going to give us the dark bands. Uh, let me try that again. So that's for destructive interference. So basically the dark bands. <clears throat> um, okay, so if we multiply by two on both sides, we get A sine theta is equal to M lambda. <clears throat> so the interesting thing is this is the formula, a similar formula we got with the double slit experiment, except for this was for constructive interference. This is for the, um, the bright bands. So you have to be careful with the single slit experiment you get the same equations, you're just applying, they're just vice versa. Um, the one where it's M lambda is for destructive interference for a single slit, but constructive interference for a double slit. And what we find is if we want to get constructive interference out of the single slit experiment, <clears throat> then what we have is A sine theta is equal to M plus one half lambda, where now in this case, the m is uh, 0, 1, 2. So there's slight differences. So you really have to be careful um, about which formula that you're going to use, because you it depends on what case you're in. If it's a double slit experiment, then it's the distance between the slits times sine theta is equal to some integer times the wavelength. Constructive interference is the distance between the slits um, and time sine theta is equal to m plus one half quantity times the, and for single slit, um, it's, it's reverse. <clears throat> so that's one reason why we're using A. So in this case, for single slit, uh, A is the uh, width of the slit, how big the slit is, um, and uh, for double slit experiment, we don't really care about the how how big the slits are. Instead, D is the um, separation between the two slits. So there are different quantities that you have to um, that you have to use. Um, so just to be aware of them. Um, again, we can use um, going back. We can use the uh, small angle approximation. So in single slit experiment, 
So if you use the small angle approximation, so theta is approximately sine theta, which is approximately tangent of theta, which is equal to the position where the bright and dark bands are going to land, divided by the distance between the slit and the screen. So then I can rewrite these um, again as um, destructive uh, a y over l is equal to m lambda, where m starts at 1, and then constructive a times y over l is equal to m plus 1 half um, lambda. So again, you have to um, you have to pay attention and kind of know and understand what each of these variables is doing instead of just kind of blindly memorizing the equations because the equations are all looking the same except for, like I said, um, they're kind of uh, reversed. <clears throat> um, so uh, um, Anyway, so if we notice uh, the single slit experiment, if we take a look at it, um, I don't have a picture on it, so I'm just going to draw it. Um, but if I have my single slit experiment, unlike the double slit, what I'm going to find is a very large maximum in, at zero, and then a dark band, and then a bright band, and then a, uh, a dark band, a bright band. Um, and so what you find is that you get this really bright maximum at m equals zero for constructive interference. <clears throat> um, and it's much more intense than the other bands, um, uh, the other, the, the later bands, the m equal one, m equal two, m equal three, um, and such. Um, so we'll get to that in a minute as to why, uh, how to calculate intensity. But the interesting thing is that if I look at the limit where theta is equal to pi over 2, so 90 degrees, then um, what I get is uh, um, well, I can put this in. I get the width A times uh, the sine of pi over 2 um, is equal to uh, m uh, times lambda. So it's look at the destructive interference. <clears throat> um, and so when I do that, I get uh, just A is equal to M lambda. Um, so, uh, okay. So I can get some limit on how many, what's the M going to be for you know, uh, basically when you're not going to see anything, when, when the pattern is not going to fit on the screen. Um, so it has to fit, you know, basically the M I get is A divided by lambda. That's the, that's the limit to how many dark bands I can see on um, the screen. We can do the same thing with constructive interference. But let's say, just for the sake of argument, that um, let's say A is equal to lambda, right? So then I'm only going to get one um, dark band. <clears throat> um, you know, m is going now going to be equal to one. So I'm going to have that really intense bright band, and then after that, it's nothing else. Um, so really, what what it's saying is that there's a limit to how small I can make the slit, um, and so basically the slit should be bigger than um, the wavelength. If I have a slit which is smaller than the wavelength, I'm not going to see any um, diffraction pattern. And it's only when the slit is much bigger than the wavelength that I'm actually going to see the diffraction pattern form on the screen. And so this is kind of an even more interesting result because if we want to use diffraction to, to measure something really small, then you have to pick a wavelength which is going to be smaller than the object you're going to see. So if you want to use diffraction on atoms, you're going to have to pick a wavelength which is going to be much smaller than the size of the actual atom. 